Hey guys, um, so final part of this week's reviews, the not DC and not Marvel books, um, starting with Swords of Sorrow, issue 3 of 6, reaching the midway point in this crossover story, and uh, this issue really does pick up more on the, the main plot and explain a bit more of what's going on rather than just introducing a whole bunch of new characters, but it still does introduce new characters and adequately show us why they are badass and deserve to be in this badass crossover. So we open on, um, on Miss Fury and uh, Black Sparrow as they uh, are watching a radio drama of their own lives. Uh, they're, I mean, I'm new to these characters too, this is just from what I'm getting from this issue, is that they're kind of like gentlemen thieves, uh, but they're ladies, and um, for some reason, for some reason uh, enough people know about them where they are the topic of a popular radio drama, a radio drama popular enough to get a, uh, a live uh, performance. And just as uh, many other kind of comic book superhero characters before them watching performances of their own lives, this one is uh, completely false. Uh, of course, the first thing my mind jumps to when seeing this sort of thing is um, the uh, Batman Beyond episode that has uh, Bruce and Terry watching a Batman musical, and... Uh, it's schwarbage. <laughs> it's so... Uh, that's how you open before uh, the show is interrupted by the Dark Crows or the Night Crows, these guys with the bird skulls on their heads, or after um, some sort of stone. We aren't... Uh, we don't know what it is at this point in the issue that we learn later on. We then cut to the present day, uh, the opening takes place in 1939, but we now cut to the present day where Eva, the daughter of Dracula, is uh, getting a lesson from her father about uh, kind of the, the crossover, how there's this guy, the prince, who wants to destroy everything, and there's one thing that can stop him, and it's the stone, the Philosopher's Stone, is uh, what they're calling it, and uh, that's the only thing that can stop him. Luckily, Sparrow and uh, Fury are already there. They already have swords, which I think they got in um, uh, spin-off issues that I haven't read. But they already have their own swords, and they are jumping right into the fray against the crows. Uh, we then got a lot of uh, kind of, not, not backstory per se, but a lot of more explanation of the main sort of conflict in this book. Uh, Purgatory, this red demon chick over here, Purgatory kidnaps the, uh, the courier, the person who's been delivering the swords, the person working for the traveler. Uh, Purgatory kidnaps him, brings him to the prince, where he, uh, where it's revealed that the prince is actually Prince Charming, and that, uh, the reason that he and the traveler have beef is because, uh, the traveler has kidnapped Snow White, who is his true love. Uh, I think it's supposed to be, not supposed to be, but uh, at least according to Disney, I thought Prince Charming went with Cinderella, but in this story it's Snow White. Maybe they'll elaborate on that. Maybe the reason the prince is evil is has something to do with Cinderella, and then Snow White happened. I don't know. I don't know. We're only three issues in. We have half the book left. But back to the, uh, the fight. Uh, Sparrow and Fury get an assist from Lady Zaro, Kato, and um, someone else are in the car, and Eva, daughter of Dracula. And you have the rest of the book is that fight scene um, until we get a little bit more information on the whole Swords of Sorrow thing and uh, what the women are supposed to be doing, or, you know, what, what are the steps to progress in this quest of theirs. And so we learn a bit more about that too, and about the um, 
the, the importance of some other characters within the crossover. Uh, so far, as I said in the previous two issues of this book, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, this book, uh, issue three, really moves the story along, really elaborates on the main sort of plot and what's going to happen and how is the whole big threat thing coming together, which is really nice because um, previous two issues really were just introducing us to more and more characters and the story was kind of falling by the wayside a little, but this one really puts the story um, uh, in the front and, and explains, okay, so this is the actual plot. Um, and yeah, just there's not a lot to not like. This book is full of badass characters doing badass things. Um, the fight scene is it's like it's not long, it's not incredibly detailed, but uh, especially because you have so many players all all going at once, but you still have enough where each person really shows, uh, really differentiates themselves in the fight. So we have uh, Eva here just being really just like gruesome and hardcore, just cutting this guy's head off, decapitating him. We have Lady Zaro, um, top of the page here, swooping in on her horse and saving, uh, I think this is Sparrow. Um, and we see her, you know, not as openly aggressive, but, you know, still managing to hold her own. Um, Cato and Masquerade, which is the other woman, they don't really do much. They, they just kind of park in the middle of the theater here. Um, and, yeah, the, the prince is such a good character, too, because it seems at, at some points in this book, as he realizes that the Traveler has Snow White, that may be the prince's, like, a, a misunderstood hero character, that, you know, he's uh, just looking for his, his true love, and maybe the Traveler has been manipulating the things the entire time. But then he really shows what a huge dick he is when he says, and I love this line, um, I will never, never surrender. I will crush all worlds. I will piss on all of history. And I love that line. I will piss on all history. And then I will bring all women under my heel. Um, like, even if this, you know, even if his true love was kidnapped, even if he has a legitimate reason for kind of hating everything, he's still petty and a dick, and he just wants to piss on history. Like, he just doesn't care about anyone else. Um, even, you know, even though, like, his own pain, yes, it hurts, it might hurt a whole lot, but, like, that's not an excuse to be petty and want to piss on all of history, you know? So, um... Like, you know, characters are getting well-rounded, getting explained more, making them more relatable, uh, understandable, um, even likable in a, in a certain sort of off way. Um, so yeah, Swords of Sorrow, really, really enjoying it. Can't wait to really see it reach uh, top gear, full gear, whatever, um, full speed. It's late, I'm mixing up my idioms. Um, but yeah, liking Swords of Sorrow. Next up, we have Saga. Issue 30, and it, it's just not fair. Saga is not a fair story. Uh, this issue in particular, it's the uh, last issue of, uh, I guess, the season. Saga comes out, if you haven't noticed by now, um, like every six issues, and then they stop for a few months, and then they continue with another six issues. So this is issue 30, Divisible by 6. The end of this kind of season of saga, and it's, it's just not fair. It, it um, I, I really don't want to open the book and, and explain much, um, but we have um, we have all, all the stories in this issue tie up. We have Marco reunite with Alana um, and bring Prince Robot with him. We have the uh, full. Uh, the, the, the Dango arc come into full, um, you know, kind of go full circle, I guess, with Dango, um, uh, with Dango, uh, Dango's retribution is kind of making up for past sins, um, and really coming full circle and, and making us kind of like Dango after all the terrible shit he's done, he, he's kind of redeemed himself, um, what else happens? Yeah, just a lot... Uh, the will is finally revived after that whole thing. We get the will back in the story. Um, and it turns out that uh, Gwendolyn didn't die in the last issue, which is great. 
Um, but, like, for every good thing that happens, something bad has to happen to even it out. And, and it really is heartbreaking. It is an emotional roller coaster because things happen. And sometimes it's in reverse. Sometimes, like, a bad thing happens and then a good thing happens, but then you realize, oh, no, the, the good thing doesn't erase the bad thing. That bad thing still happened. And just because the good thing happened, it doesn't make the bad thing not... It's like, it's, there are points in this book where, like, I, I wanted to cry, but, uh, like, I knew, oh, wait, they're gonna, something is going to happen. And, oh, it's so bittersweet. Everything in this book is, like, so bittersweet. It's so up and down and good and bad and, and happy and angry. And it's, it's not fair. It's hard to read this book because of, um... It's so good at, at like just reaching those emotions, at, at making you think, "Oh, things might be better," and then never mind. We're gonna take things. We're gonna take even more away from you. Um, it is like I, I'm kind of on the verge of tears now, remembering everything that happens in this book and just how it happens. Um, needless to say, this book, at you know, thirty issues in, still just as great as ripping right through all of your defenses and, and making you care about these characters and making you happy for them, making you sad for them when things don't work out. Um, they're just so human and they're struggling with very relatable emotions in very relatable ways. These characters get fucking pissed and they also, you, you know, they, they get happy. They, they, they reach the whole, they cover the whole spectrum in a very human way, in a very relatable way. Um, in dealing with all these events that they're going through, and um, God, it's so good. <laughs> it's such a good book. Um, and I, I really don't want to. Seriously, if you're not reading Saga, um, I, I mean, this issue is going to be collected in a trade soon. I would just pick the whole thing up in trade if you can, and and read it all. It is so good. You will care about every character. You will like every character, even the terrible characters, you will find something to like about them that will make you want to read their story and continue the story. Um, oh, it's just, it's just not fair. It really, it really isn't fair um, how good this is and how easily it seems that Brian uh, and, and Fiona just like play, just like play your heartstrings, you know, like a fucking violin. Um, Jeez. Honestly, it, it is something else. Saga is an experience. You, you should totally read it for yourself. It is amazing. Um, just hands down. I haven't, like, picked up an issue of Sex Criminals for a while. The net, you know, the, the newest issue has been delayed uh, at least a month now, I think. Um, and in that time, Saga has... It, it's definitely close, you know, between my favorite. It also, one's a comedy and one's more drama. Saga is probably my favorite dramatic comic out at, at right now. I'm, like, safe in saying. Like, it, uh, of all the comics, it really does every issue stir something in me. It is amazing. Um, like, I can't, I can't say that enough. Uh, just how good this comic is at, at, at nailing everything you could possibly want from it. Um, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm just repeating myself now. But, but, like, I don't even know if I'm going to continue with this review. Just talking about this book makes, just like, thinking, I haven't even told you all the bad things that happened in this book. But just thinking about them makes me so emotional. I don't know. I'm going to need a second. Jesus Christ. <sighs> Deep breaths. <sighs> I think that's the best endorsement I've ever given of a single issue of a comic book, is, like, I have to take some breaths after talking about it. That, oh, jeez, that is something. So, moving on, if I can, moving on to <laughs> Injection, issue number three. And, uh, again, this, this book... Uh, I think it's really uh, picking up. Last issue, I said this might be something you want to read in trade. 
I, I'm not completely reversing that that uh, that judgment just yet, but in terms of things going on, answers um, being given to questions, uh, this book is that this issue does provide a lot more than issue two did. Um, so we start with getting one character, the computer uh, person, person who's been at the computer, uh, kind of having their finger in everyone's pie, uh, finally gets out of her computer room and is summoned uh, by um, by uh, Simeon Winters. And I forget if that's the character that's been introduced uh, by name, because I'm terrible with names. but. She's finally doing something outside of the room. She's finally moving to new places, which is nice to see. And then we get a really good expository conversation between um, between Robin and Maria uh, over here. And as you can probably tell by this poster uh, in Maria's office that says, I want to believe, uh, this is a really kind of x files -y inspired conversation with Robin as Mulder and uh, Maria as Scully. Um, uh, basically, Maria contacts Robin, asks him what's up with that whole weird shit that happened uh, in issues one and two, and Robin explains it all, and uh, here's where reading Warren Ellis' newsletter really puts things into focus, um, and also watching a lot of the talks he's been giving about kind of uh, old folklore and science and all that, uh, it really all comes together in this Robin character who explains that um, all of the things that have been happening have uh, kind of followed the uh, Spriggan folklore, Spriggans being a type of pixie um, that cause all sorts of mischief and uh, tells Maria how to fight back against the Spriggans. Um, so... Yeah, if you, like, it, it's all has to do with, like, kind of where folklore is in modern culture. Um, at least that's what I'm getting from the, uh, from Warren Ellis' talks about these sorts of things. And, and it is really interesting. Um, I don't know if I'm finding it more interesting because I read the newsletter and I can make all those connections in my head between the Warren Ellis I've read in the newsletter and seen in the talks and all that and what's finally happening in this book. Um... I mean, just because of who I am and the experiences I've had previous to reading this book, I can't tell if I would enjoy it more or less by not knowing any of this and by having this fresh. Um, I also have a feeling that because uh, this is an idea I'm already familiar with, it comes um, just as exposition, it comes across as more tolerable um, than if I hadn't known all this in the beginning, more or less tolerable, rather. Um, I don't know. But during the conversation, uh, which I think is very, very good exposition, also very interesting. Again, I'm just like interested in folklore, like all the folklore things too. Um, you get this in a lot of Neil Gaiman sort of things too, and I'm a big fan of Neil Gaiman's. Um, where am I though? Yeah. So as he's explaining how the folklore works, uh, he uh, Robin kind of gets transported out of his hotel room into this weird forest thingy, and um, not quite explained what happens to him, but we've gotten a lot of answers, so uh, at this point when the story wants to ask more questions, I, I uh, give it the benefit of the doubt. Robin also brings up uh, the injection, how all this mysterious weird things is being caused by the injection, which uh, is, the, is the title of the book over here. We're still not uh, given an explanation as to what the injection is. All we know is that it's some weird sort of thing that likes to cause mischief and bend space and time, and that it works by um, making all this folkloric stuff real. But it has to follow the rules, which is why Robin was part of that secret team that happened in issues one and two that we're getting all those flashbacks of. And we get another flashback to the formation of that team uh, later on in this book as well. Uh, after the conversation, we also get a very good look at kind of Maria's character. How, um, I mean, everybody in this team is a genius, and we see that in the, in this little scene here where we have everyone explaining who they are and what they do. Uh, Robin is a, uh, cunning man, which is a sort of old traditional English wizard, uh, character. Or he comes from a family of cunning people, 
and he doesn't want to be a cunning person, but he has all the knowledge of, like, English folklore and stuff, which makes him qualify to be this kind of pseudo-wizard sort of a character. Um, uh, trying to find people's names. Um, Bridget, who is the computer character, the, the computer wizard over here. Bridget is uh, a computer genius. She made an artificial intelligence and everything. Um, we have the leader, the organizer here. Um, I forget his name, and I don't think they say it, uh, who is a MI6 secret agent character, so kind of the James Bond sort of guy, uh, except probably more qualified to be James Bond. Um, this character, I forget their name, is a Sherlock Holmes type investigator. So everyone is like top of their field. And we still don't know exactly what Maria does, but she is some sort of scientist. Uh, and she considers herself a genius, and she feels um, uh, disrespected, how everyone finds Robin more interesting. Everyone asks about Robin because he's the wizard, and no one appreciates her genius, even though she is a very accomplished scientist were given to, uh, to, 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 from her own uh, point of view. A very accomplished scientist who is uh, undervalued by, kind of overshadowed by the rest of the team and their more peculiar interests. Um, so yeah, uh, I think this issue really picked up, answered a lot of questions that needed answering, gives a lot of explanation that needed to be given in order for the story to really make sense and to help people follow it. Again, uh, not quite sure if this is a wait for trade, just to have all of it in one place and not have to wait month to month for explanations of things. Um, if you like that sort of mystery, then definitely pick up Injection issue by issue, because um, at this point it is building to a very, very uh, curious mystery. You know, what is the injection? What does it have against these people? Do these people create it? You know, how, how are everybody connected? What's happening now? Why is it returning? All that sort of thing. Very x files -y. Um, I mean, less Monster of the Week stuff going on at this point, but just in terms of you have the skeptic, you have the person who believes in all the magic things and seems to be an expert. Drawing that parallel, especially between Robin and Maria, for the main players in this issue, at least. Um, so yeah, uh, just, just very, very interesting good stuff. Uh, I also recommend uh, Warren Ellis' newsletter. Um, it's called uh, Orbital Operations. I'm sure if you Google Warren Ellis or Orbital Operations, you'll find that. He's a very good writer. Uh, his newsletters are just very engaging, interesting weekly things that come out. Uh, he likes to talk about interesting things. He also talks about his personal life. And, um, like, really, his newsletter, more than anything else, makes me interested in reading his work, his comics. So uh, I, I definitely recommend his newsletter uh, just as strongly as any of his comics. And that is it for Injection Issue 3. And one more book that I wanted to review this week, uh, number one, one that I've been kind of interested in picking up for a while now, Invader Zim, issue number one. Um, if you've never heard of Invader Zim before, uh, Invader Zim used to be a cartoon on Nickelodeon in the early to mid-2000s. Um, created by Johan Vasquez, who is a kind of ind independent comic book creator. Um, Invader Zim was his first cartoon uh, on Nickelodeon. It had a lot of production issues involving kind of creative differences between uh, Vasquez and the Nickelodeon network, but it became kind of a cult classic, has a very dedicated fan following, and this is the first Invader Zim thing to really come out in years. Um, we very hopefully begin with a uh, with the recap kid explaining basically the plot of Invader Zim, which involves this guy Zim, uh, an alien invader coming to Earth, and he's hilariously incompetent. Um, the only person on Earth who seems to recognize that he is an alien is uh, this kid Dib, uh, who goes to school with Zim. Zim is disguised as he's infiltrating human humanity and learning about human cultures as a uh, school child, Zim goes to the same school and is the only one who recognizes he's an alien. Zim is assisted by his robot Gurr, and his robot malfunctions. He's not quite right in the head. Um, 
And so that's the ba the main plot. Vader Zim tries to take over Earth, is really bad at it, Dib tries to stop him, um, but is also pretty bad at it, or doesn't need to be as good as, uh, as you'd think uh, an alien fighting force would have to be in order to combat an alien. And, I, I mean, to be completely honest, this book completely nails the feel of the cartoon. If you were a fan of the Invader Zim cartoon, you will probably very much enjoy this book. It nails the look, it nails the, uh, the, 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 the script, the writing. It's all incredibly on point. Um, and it's... Uh, at the same time, something that does separate the cartoon and the book, and something very important that this book is missing and that this book can never have is voice acting. Um, part of what really made the cartoon, what really brought these characters to life was the voice acting. Was, I mean, it, voice it, it's a sort of acting. It's the enunciation. It's the characterization you get from each character's cadence and how they talk. Um, and if you don't have an idea of what that is already in your head from watching the cartoon, then this book doesn't work. I, I, I don't think this book would work anywhere near as well as it does for someone who does have that voice, who does remember how all the characters talk in their head. And even if you do have that memory, it doesn't compare to actually listening to, to, to the voice actors. You know, it doesn't actually compare to hearing these characters talk in their voices and delivering their lines as these characters would deliver them. Um, and... I mean, that is a huge chunk of, of Invader Zim. That's a huge chunk of any cartoon, is the acting. And that's something you can't recreate in this book. It's just a, a, a part of the medium. You can't do that. Comic books don't have a sound in that, in that same respect. And even though this book nails the humor, even, this, even though the book looks like Invader Zim and hits all the, the, the plot points and everything that an Invader Zim episode would hit, the lack of voice acting really does hurt the overall product. Because um, the, the characters don't feel as real. They don't feel as complete as the cartoon. They're lacking that. They're lacking that emotion that you get from acting. Um, and, and, yeah, especially because... Like, the acting, it's not people talking. A lot of the voice acting in Invader Zim was screaming. It was these very emotional kind of screams and over-the-top laughter, and all the characters are so over-the-top, and they're performed over-the-top, and you can't imagine that sort of over-performance in your head in the same way that you can get from an actual cartoon, from an actual voice performance. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I hate to say it, but... I probably won't be picking up the second issue because the lack of voice acting is such a huge issue. Um, such a huge deficit when, when switching mediums. Um, now again, I don't know, but like, I, I have a feeling this book won't work as well for someone who's never seen the cartoon because they don't even have an idea of how these characters are supposed to talk, but maybe... If you never saw the cartoon, this might work better because you aren't coming in with that sort of expectation. That you really come, that, that you really are coming in with completely your own expectations of how these characters can talk, and maybe that's just it, that works better for you. Um, but yeah, that it's it's just so weird. It it feels just off in that very uncanny. Everything should work. Every everything's in the right place. Everything. All the characters are just as you should remember them acting, but they're not actually, you know, you don't have that, that crucial element, that crucial sensory information. Um, and that really sucks. That really sucks. It's so close. I mean, I, I would honestly, if you just had someone read this book to me, if you had the voice actors read this book to me, I would enjoy it just as much as I enjoy the original cartoon, but that is such a sticking point for me that I don't know if I can actually read this book and enjoy it to the extent that I would like to enjoy it. Um, yeah, such a, such a weird thing going on there with that. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's that. Uh, that is the end of the comic book reviews for this week. But before I go, uh, I know last week I mentioned I did want to have reviews up of, um, of uh, The Wicked and the Divine 
and Satellite Sam. Unfortunately, my holiday weekend was a lot busier than I thought it would be. I had a lot more plans uh, that I made like Thursday and Friday that I didn't know I would have on Wednesday, which uh, really kind of ate up my weekend. Um, I started reading a lot of the books or continue reading a lot of the books. I don't know when I'm going to have the reviews up. This is looking like another kind of busy weekend for me. Um, I mean, I'm going to try to get to it. As always, um, you know, I'll read as much as I can, and if I end up finishing and have the time to do a proper review, I'll sit down and do that. But uh, I, I, I don't want to make any promises again, just in case I, I won't be able to live up to them. So, sorry about that. If you're expecting that, I know at least one person was. Anyway... Uh, thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please like the video. If you want more of these every week, please subscribe. Uh, any comments, anything whatsoever, feel free to leave them below and I will try to get to them. And yes, thanks for watching and I hope you'll join me next week for some more comic book reviews.